Good morning and welcome to the 2005 Symposium of the Duke Environmental Law and Policy Forum. Uh, today we're looking at regional ocean governance as a framework for ecosystem-based management of our oceans and coasts here in the U.S. We've got a distinguished group of panelists and moderators, so we're looking forward to some lively debate, hopefully. Um, we're particularly looking forward to a final roundtable in which we'll be trying to develop some practical advice for our leaders in Congress on how to move forward with regional ocean governance. So without further ado, Dr. Norm Christensen is a professor of ecology and the founding dean of the Nicholas School of the Environment. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, it really is my great pleasure to welcome you to this conference on ocean ecosystem management challenges and opportunities for regional ocean government, governance. Uh, I'm especially pleased to be offering this welcome on behalf of several collaborating Duke sponsors, including the Duke Law School, uh, the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions, the Nicholas School of the Environment, and the Terry Sanford Institute of Public Policy. Uh, the discussion we're gonna, we will undertake today really defines um, a, what I think is a grand interdisciplinary challenge and this diverse sponsorship, I think, is emblematic of Duke University's unique ability to rise to such a challenge. Uh, about a decade ago, in fact, almost exactly a decade ago, I chaired a national committee that was charged with articulating the scientific basis for what was then, and arguably still is, a vaguely defined concept, ecosystem management. Uh, we surveyed the literature in this area, identified dozens of different definitions, and struggled mightily, and I should add, uh, not very successfully, to construct our own crisp definition uh, for that phrase. Um, as I said, unsuccessfully, therefore I'm not going to burden you with the definition we came up with. Rather, uh, I'd like to identify five important themes that we found were really common to almost every discussion of the notion of ecosystem management. First and foremost is the idea that in management, sustainability uh, ought to be a central goal. Sustainability here defined um, as in the Brundtland Commission as a notion that embodies intergenerational responsibility. Further, uh, a notion of sustainability that acknowledges the inevitability, indeed the desirability of constant change. Changes in ecosystems, changes in human societies, cultures, and economies, and more recently the understanding of human impacts on changes in the world at large. The second theme that seemed to come through in virtually all discussions could be summarized in the phrase, no peace thinking, or alternatively that systems approaches are critical. Whatever element of the world that you happen to be managing, however, however small it might be, it's absolutely critical that it be understood as part of a much more complex system. The third issue that appears repeatedly is the fact that arbitrary boundaries are inevitable. In this discussion, oftentimes the focus is on arbitrary geographic boundaries, the um, meaninglessness of a straight line, for example, or of using a river as a boundary between two jurisdictions where you're trying to manage water. Um, but just as important, uh, in fact, maybe more important, are arbitrary jurisdictional boundaries. Uh, the fact that there are no fewer than, I think, seven different federal agencies involved in the management of salmon uh, is a good example. And for those of us who reside at this wonderful institution, um, disciplinary boundaries are usually at least as daunting. The fourth issue that again came up repeatedly is the fact, the inevitability that knowledge is imperfect, that ignorance, complexity, and chaos conspire to limit not only what we know, but to limit in fact what we can know. And therefore management must necessarily be adaptive. Finally, and I think centrally, Ecosystem management acknowledges the central role of people, not just as creators of problems, but as critical and long-standing elements of virtually all ecosystems and essential participants in the formulation and execution 
of management solutions. Ten years ago, you can go back and kind of look at the literature, ten years ago the phrase ecosystem management was widely applied in various areas to forest management, river basin management, rangeland management. It was beginning to appear in unlikely places, such as in discussions of industrial management, as in industrial ecology, uh, or in areas like city and regional planning. The one place that it was not appearing, interestingly, was in the ocean literature. Now, I should qualify that by saying that certainly by 10 years ago, there had been an enormous number of really excellent papers dealing with the notion of ocean ecosystems. But the first paper actually focusing explicitly on the phrase ecosystem management in oceans was actually published in 1996. As today's conference indicates, this situation has changed enormously. But even so, I think it's uh, useful as maybe a way of starting off the discussion today to wonder why this idea has perhaps more recently become fashionable among those who are studying and managing nearly two-thirds of the Earth's surface. And I think there really are lots of very good reasons, mostly related to the enormous and unique challenges that oceans present relative to the five points that I just mentioned. Sustainability, for example. It wasn't all that long ago that oceans were viewed as inexhaustible sources of natural resources, of food, energy, recreation, as well as insatiable sinks for whatever it was we wanted to dump into them. Today, with great numbers of fish stocks in decline, with energy running short, with vast dead zones developing around river outlets, we can no longer take sustainability of the ocean for granted. Second, it isn't that ocean-oriented folks have been in denial about systems thinking. Rather, it is that the systems that they must think about are so incredibly vast, so incredibly open-ended, and so incredibly complex. The boundary issue. Boundaries in oceans have always been a problem. Ocean scientists have had more than their share of difficulties defining what we mean by, for example, an ocean ecosystem in anything other than what we might call vast terms, something that has come to be known as the large ecosystem concept. Uh, regulatory boundaries defining access and jurisdiction, three-mile limits, 200-mile uh, limits, could not be more arbitrary relative to the resources uh, that we have to, to manage. Ocean challenges are truly interdisciplinary, and I would have to say this is an area where disciplines have been more resistant than others to communication and collaboration. The level of uncertainty about ocean systems is magnified by their complexity and by what we might call their lack of transparency. You just can't see what's in them. They're kind of a black box. The bounds of uncertainty around even the most important resources have, been a, have set central limits on our ability to cope with a host of ocean challenges, from managing stocks of salmon and cod to the conservation of coral reefs. Finally, integrating the human dimension presents a particular challenge in oceans. Lacking clear rights of property ownership, our oceans are clearly vulnerable to the tragedy of the commons. We struggle just to identify, much less engage, the array of stakeholders associated with ocean challenges. Having said all this, it's, I think, amazing that in the last several years, um, it is ocean scholars, scholars pardon me, managers and decision makers who have become the most enthusiastic champions of ecosystem management. I think this conference will provide a wonderful opportunity to explore just where we are and where we've come in the last decade and the application of this idea to one of our most dear and threatening resources. Um, I'm positive it'll be a terrific day. It's my great pleasure to introduce the moderator for the first panel this morning, a longtime friend and colleague, Dr. Michael Orbach, the director of the Duke University Marine Laboratory. Um, professor of Marine Policy and Affairs in the Nicholas School of the Environment. Um, Mike is um, ideally suited to take on this role of moderator for a variety of reasons. He's one of the best moderators I know, and he's a very moderate individual. But uh, beyond that, Mike has, um, uh, has that wonderful combination of training in, and, and interdisciplinary knowledge 
a person who started off in his, his career wanting to be an economist, eventually getting his PhD in cultural anthropology, and now leading, I think, one of the most diverse and interdisciplinary uh, programs on uh, ocean management in the country. So Mike, it's good to have you here, and um, welcome to the podium. Would the panel please join me up here at the uh, head table? Thank you, Norm. I have to say parenthetically that when uh, Ingrid approached me about who should be at a meeting like this in terms of the speakers, and we began to develop the list, uh, I cautioned her that these were all very busy, important people, and she couldn't expect to get very many of them, really. And she got everybody she wanted. This is a tremendous compliment to Ingrid's persistence, among other things. <laughs> so you're in for a, for a treat today with this, with this group. And I see, looking around the faces in the audience, that we have the right audience as well to have a very engaging discussion of this, this topic. Uh, following on from Norm's comments, uh, the, the history of trying to do some kind of regional effort on something with coasts and the oceans has a fairly long history. Um, in the oceans, uh, with fisheries, you found ICNAF, the North Atlantic Fisheries Organization, uh, with which one of our other speakers, Andy, who is very familiar. Uh, in the South Pacific, the South Pacific Fisheries uh, Forum Agency. Uh, many other attempts have been made to try and, either because of the biophysical regionality of something, or my area, the human ecology of a region. How do people move around the region? Whose behavior do you actually have to manage with respect to a, a particular biophysical system? Uh, those efforts, uh, some of them have been terrestrial related to water, such as the river basin commissions uh, in this country. Uh, that concept was picked up in laws such as the Coastal Zone Management Act, uh, later the National Estuary Program, uh, back again to fisheries with the regional fishery management councils and the Magnuson, uh, Magnuson Stevens Act. Uh, and uh, the discussion culminated in a sense with the two recent ocean commissions, first the Pew and then the United States Commission on Ocean Policy, uh, both of which uh, discussed very, uh, in, in very much depth this regional concept. Uh, I had the pleasure to be an advisor to both of those groups, and I can tell you that there was a great deal of discussion of the exact concept that we're talking about here today. I will say, and uh, Laura Cantrell, our first presenter, will elaborate on the Commission's uh, activities and outcomes here this morning. I will say, having been in the discussions with both those commissions on these topics, that they were a little stymied in getting beyond principle with this regional governance issue. Once you started to get into the messy business of what happens on land and across the land-sea boundary, the discussion got a lot more difficult. And that's the kind of discussion that we're going to try to advance today, specifically, I think, across the land-sea boundary. So what we're talking about here today is not just the ocean or traditional marine realm. It's crossing the terrestrial marine and, in many ways, atmospheric boundaries, uh, boundaries as well. Our first presenter uh, is Laura Cantrell. Laura uh, is now with... Uh, uh, the firm Meridian that is trying to further uh, the results and the outcomes from the two Ocean Commission reports. Uh, she is uh, a, a Mississippi girl by birth and has spent a great deal of time with her legal background working in the, the Mississippi and Gulf region and then in the state of Florida and moved to Washington, D.C. and was the, um, was the Associate Director for Governance for the U.S. Ocean Commission. And Laura's going to begin our discussion today with uh, an overview of the two commissions and the activities she's involved with now. We're trying to move them forward. Laura? Thank you, Mike. And you know what? I don't understand why I'm mic'd here and have this thing plugged in here. Is there a reason why we need both of these on? Can I take it off? We want to make sure we catch Only if you want what? to wander. Well, if I'm going to be a motivational speaker and walk around, so I, I'm still mic'd, you can still hear me? Is that right? Yeah. All right, that's cool. <laughs> um, we knew you wanted to. I know, I know. I have to tell you that um, I'm intimidated by, for a couple of reasons. I'm going to start with a couple of true confessions. And um, 
and, and one of them is that the speakers who follow me have these really fancy slides, and they're beautiful, and they have photos and, and graphics, and, and I've got really boring slides that have a lot of words on them. So you bear with me on that. The other thing that, and I'm the first speaker, so I set the tone for the day, and hopefully we'll get a good, some good energy going and, and, and get you ready to chime in with some discussion because that's the way the organizers have, have planned the day. See, I'm already motivational speaker mode, right? But um, back to my own law school days, I became terrified when I saw my friend here who has these cards he's going to hold up to the speakers, letting them know time. And that, yeah, I'm having flashbacks to when I was doing uh, appellate argument mock trials in law school, and especially this one. Stop, for the love of God, please stop. <laughs> so hopefully I haven't wasted too much of my time going through that. Um, then the other thing that I'm intimidated about is that I'm told that this is an idiot-proof clicker for the slides, but I can always prove that wrong, so I'm sure that you'll have to bear with me on that as well. Um, as Mike indicated, I, I have some experience with um, the work of both of the commissions, uh, in particular background working with the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy and now in my role at the Meridian Institute helping uh, support the work of the two commissions who are coming together as the Joint Ocean Commission Initiative to try to further the work of the commissions and the implementation of their recommendations. I, I want to share with you a little bit about that, uh, specifically as it's related to the topic of the discussion today, and then leave you with a list of challenges that, um, that uh, are that hearken to some of the things that Norm said, and I believe will be the kind, at least in my experience in listening to these discussions, are the kinds of questions that continue to come up. They're the questions that the commissions grappled with, as Mike indicated, and perhaps didn't get as crystallized as they could because they're difficult questions. So that's why you're here today, and to help us uh, formulate more ideas about that. This slide is just to share with you the um, the general direction that I'm going to go uh, in in my remarks. Um, a brief history, uh, don't worry, it's going to be really brief history of U.S. ocean and coastal policy, uh, including the um, presence of these two national ocean commissions and their consensus reports, being the Pew Oceans Commissions and the U.S. Commission. Um, and then, the, again, the topic of the day, ecosystem-based management approaches and the uh, viability of regional ocean governance in, in helping us implement ecosystem-based management, ideas that were endorsed and recommended by both of the commissions. Then, I, again, I'm going to describe for you the work that they're doing together as the joint initiative and, as I mentioned, leave you with a list of challenges. Now, I have to tell you that I had originally had about seven or eight slides on brief history to share with you. And, and just this morning, I decided that that was way too much and it was too early for that. Um, and so I boiled it down to this one slide with six bullets. So here's my attempt at the brief history of ocean policy in uh, 30 seconds, uh, 50 years in 30 seconds. But I, I do think that it's interesting to see the sweeping arc of the development of, of policy in this area over the last 50 plus years starting with the post-World War era where the focus in the U.S. was on oceanography and other ocean capabilities and competition with the Soviets to be uh, world leaders and, and dominant in science and technology. Um, in the mid-60s, there was the creation of the Stratton Commission, which was our country's first comprehensive look at uh, ocean policy and how we are managing ocean and coastal resources in this nation. Uh, after the commission, the Stratton Commission uh, issued its report in 1969, the early 70s saw the passage of uh, landmark, not landmarks, legislation uh, in the creation of new institutions. Uh, Mike mentioned some of those landmark pieces of legislation, such as the Coastal Zone Management Act, the Magnuson-Stevens Fisheries Act, a Marine Mammal Protection Act. There's uh, a long list. Um, then. Uh, as those pieces of legislation uh, came, uh, were enacted and began to be implemented, uh, the, um, the, the commentary is, is pretty consistent that there was a development of a piecemeal and, and ad hoc approach 
to managing resources as those pieces of legislation were implemented in management responses around um, the resources. And that led to many um, unmet cries by observers and, and leaders, National Research Council, members of Congress, um, perhaps people in this room, uh, uh, maintained that it was time for the country to revisit the way we manage these resources and take another comprehensive view um, of the way uh, our ocean policy is headed. And that led to, in, by the end of the 90s and early in this decade, not one, but two national um, level ocean commissions. So there you go, 30 seconds or less, uh, ocean policy uh, by Laura Cantrell. <laughs> you can see this for yourself, I won't read it all to you, but just some factoids on the um, Pew Oceans Commission, which was uh, created, privately funded, created by the Pew Charitable Trusts and had 18 members chaired by um, the Honorable Leon Panetta. The focus of the Pew Commission was primarily on um, management of living marine resources and uh, environmental quality, water quality, uh, pollution, and also um, a, a good deal of focus on governance reform. You can see other issues that they covered in their report listed there, and also their process, uh, very inclusive process, many regional meetings all over the country, uh, lots of uh, stakeholder involvement, and uh, the commissioners broke themselves into working groups to, to formulate recommendations around the different topics they covered, culminating with a consensus report that was released in May of 2003. The U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy, many maintain that when the Pew Charitable Trust created the Pew Ocean Commission, that was what finally stimulated Congress to pass legislation to create a federal study commission. And whether that's true or not, is open to speculation, but the fact remains that the Oceans Act of 2000 was passed and it did create a 16-member uh, commission appointed by the Congress and the President. Uh, it was 16 members, bipartisan, diverse group, chaired by Admiral James Watkins. Um, the, the list of issues that the commission covered is long, and, and I won't recite that to you. I will just describe to you generally that uh, just about anything that you can think of related to ocean and coastal resources and their use and management was within the mandate of the commission and uh, Congress asked the commission to look into. Its process was also um, uh, very uh, inclusive. It included a panel, uh, uh, Mike Orbach, there are others in this room who were science advisors and, and, and legal advisors to the commission. Uh, it held public meetings all over the country, site visits, heard from over 450 witnesses, uh, and, and, and held a very um, extensive stakeholder and scientific review process that culminated with the release of its report a little over a year ago in September 2004. The Oceans Act of 2000 required that President Bush respond to the Commission's report within 90 days of its release. And the President did that uh, last December with an executive order and a U.S. Ocean Action Plan. This um, action plan sets up a federal interagency structure that is now um, underway and, and being carried out. It also articulates a number of the administration's priorities uh, as related to and in response to the Commission's recommendations. And I do want to point out that while um, it's not very specific, in, the plan is not very specific regarding regional approaches, it does um, give a shout out to two particular regional processes, one in the Great Lakes and the other in the Gulf of Mexico. And a footnote to this point is to share with you that while I'm not going to talk in any depth about those processes in my remarks today, um, uh, Ingrid Nugent and I are working on the written paper that will be the product uh, that will be in the, in the symposium proceedings that will uh, examine these two processes in more depth, not so much comparing and contrasting, but how were they set up, 
what kind of mechanisms are they using and what kind of lessons do they offer for um, students and uh, experimenters of regional ocean governance. So what is the relevance of the Ocean Commission's work to regional ocean governance? As I mentioned, both reports endorsed and recommended ecosystem-based management as one of the fundamental principles that needs to undergird all, uh, all reform of, of ocean and coastal policy. And while the Commission's recommendations differed in the implementation of those approaches, I would maintain that the underlying rationale for, uh, for their need is the same, and uh, three points below. That one is that the, the governmental units at the regional level are at the appropriate scale to implement many of the needed reforms. And also that ecosystem-based management, by, by very definition, must be implemented at the local level. And regional scale is, the, again, the, the appropriate scale to do that implementation. And then finally, the ability to engage and involve citizens at the local level. Um, this is one of the biggest challenges, and it's not related just to regional ocean governance, but being able to motivate citizens and to understand about the importance to care about where they live and the resources that they love and care about. So now I'll just tell you very briefly about the work of the Joint Ocean Commission Initiative, which it is, just as its very clever title suggests, the work of the two commissions coming together uh, to try to continue the um, momentum generated by the release of these two uh, important reports. Uh, these commissioners uh, embody a wealth of experience and, and expertise, and none of them were willing to just hand off their reports with a hearty handshake and hope for the best, but wanted to continue to work toward implementation. So um, earlier this year, or at the beginning of the year, Admiral Watkins as the chair of the U.S. Commission and Leon Panetta as the chair of the Pew Commission agreed that it, it made sense to join forces and work together to find the appropriate forums and mechanisms for them as commissioners to engage and remind our policymakers that the recommendations contained in those reports are important and worth paying attention to. So the goal, as articulated here, is just that, to, to help accelerate the pace of change toward meaningful ocean and coastal policy reform at all levels of government, and to build upon the consensus work of the two commissions. It's a diverse membership, and that diversity is political, it's geographical, it's, it's expertise-oriented, and also the outcomes of the two commissions. One thing that the that I will share with you that the joint initiative is not, is um, it's not a renegotiation of any of the recommendations in those two reports. It's not a super consensus of consensus. Um, it uh, hasn't been too surprising to uh, those who followed the work of the commissions closely that when the reports came out, there is uh, a high degree of compatibility and commonality uh, between the two reports. Uh, they aren't exactly the same. They didn't reach the same conclusions in every instance. Um, the scope of the U.S. Commission was different than the Pew Commission, but there's a high degree of compatibility, and many of the, the findings that the two commissions reached were, uh, were the same. So it's, um, it, it makes sense for them to work together to deliver that message, to work in a very bipartisan manner, to try to have influence on uh, making a difference in implementing these recommendations. I think that um, that first bullet, I, I think that I've s summarized that adequately, but I do want to point out that, um, that the uh, initiative is, while working at the national level, wor working at the regional level and trying to help stimulate change among stakeholders at local levels, also working at the national level on um, particular a number of priority issues that seem to be ripe and appropriate for these commissioners to work on. And I've just listed the ones. I wanted you to be aware of the, the, 
the issues that the joint initiative is currently engaged in and focused on and feels are really important to make happen now. And the first one is governance reform, and that's both at the national level and at the regional level, which is what we're primarily talking about today. Also, fisheries management, management reform, funding for ocean management and science, and U.S. accession to the United Nations Law of the Sea, Treaty on, Convention on the Law of the Sea. This is just some process details about the initiative, the way it operates. It's guided by a 10-member task force, five commissioners from each commission. Andy Rosenberg, one of our speakers today, is uh, a member of our task force, or the initiative's task force. It's led by uh, Leon Panetta and Admiral Watkins. The initial funding for the effort has been provided by the Packard and the Marissala Foundations. And Meridian Institute is coordinating the design and implementation and supporting the work of both the initiative and the task force. The task force serves uh, as the, I call the steering committee for the initiative. They've been working together for, uh, 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 since the first of the year, but officially and formally announced their existence at a press briefing in Washington uh, last month. September 22nd, which roughly coincided with the release of the U.S. Commission's report. Yeah, I'm not, there we go. At the regional level, the goal of the initiative is to seek involvement of these commissioners where there can be a value added to their presence, either in existing efforts or potential where there's interest and motivation to get going with these regional uh, approaches. I've just listed some that the initiative is involved in or ev ev in discussions uh, with leaders about. And some of the ways that the initiative can bring that value added to um, at the regional level include the active presence and participation of the commissioners who are in that region who bring their own constituencies and political capital and expertise and, and, and uh, other uh, assets, and also the presence of the commission's chairs, um, monitoring what's going on in the different regions and communicating that, helping to be uh, a, a, a voice to uh, garner visibility within the ocean community and also beyond. Convening and facilitating workshops, discussions like this, Meridian is a convening and facilitation entity, so I, I need to throw that one in. And then also networks, I think that's pretty obvious to the, the initiative is um, a, an opportunity to increase the communication and exchange of people who are active in these regions and working on these efforts. So I'm leaving you now with my list of challenges, as I said in the beginning of my remarks. These are some of the questions that come up when I hear discussions about this topic. They're, they're, uh, they allude to some of the points that Norm made in the acknowledgement of what ecosystem-based management is. And um, I, again, I'm not going to read them all. You can see what they are. But the challenge of how to define a region, what, what is a region, how do you square an eco-region with socio-political regions, variation in approach. There's going to be variation in approach. Is that a good thing? How much? Uh, how much uniformity should there be? Is it OK if everyone does their own thing and we just bless it and call it regional? ocean governance, many uh, institutional and uh, legal impediments exist, and I think we'll hear more about that later. The political will, and then I'll just end with the ongoing lament that, that we're hearing uh, a lot of right now in discussions with people who are working on Capitol Hill and also in you know, state capitals, which is that even given all of the study, all of the literature, all of the definitions, there's this sense that we don't know what ecosystem-based management is. It sounds nice, but we don't know what it is, and we don't know how to implement it. Finally, uh, getting the public's attention is going to be key to any of these efforts. So with that, he said stop for the love of God, so I'm going to stop. Uh, we're going to hold questions till after all the presentations because we've allowed quite a large time space for questions and discussion. So 
please hold your questions till all the presenters have, uh, have, have finished. Uh, our next presenter is Susan Hanna. Now she's listed on your program as a professor of marine economics at Oregon State University. Let me tell you, she is actually a renaissance woman and professional masquerading as a mild-mannered economist. Uh, she is one of the more broad thinking and acting economists I know. As Norm said, I used to be one, so I can comment and agree on this. Uh, I've had the great pleasure of serving with Susan on just a, a few of the boards and commissions and exercises, uh, the National Academy panel on IFQs uh, we served on together. And another exercise which I helped out with that is interestingly not listed on her bio, which was a fine effort she led for the, the Heinz Center for uh, Economics and the Environment, which has produced a book called Fishing Grounds, that if you've not seen it, is the most incisive and thorough, and I have to say anthropologically produced, analysis of our federal fishing management system that I know of. If you don't know that uh, publication, you should certainly get familiar with us. Susan is going to take us into the area of ocean governance from an economics perspective. I suspect it will be broader than that. Susan. Good morning. I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak at this symposium uh, and to address some of these issues. And I'm going to start by raising some general issues as we move from recommendations for structure for ecosystem-based management and regional ocean governance, as we move from that into actual implementation. And this is where it begins to get a little more difficult, a little more nuanced, a little more messy, but we do have experience with uh, other uh, resource management issues that can lend some insight. And in fact, we have some insights that can be offered from the whole field of institutional economics, and I'm going to address some of these this morning. As Laura mentioned, the uh, Commission on Ocean Policy uh, recommended that ecosystem-based ocean governance be set up under a whole national ocean policy framework. And this framework consists of a number of pieces and very importantly a number of coordination efforts. Uh, coordination at the national level across federal agencies, uh, coordination in the ocean space with much more harmonized resource management across the various authorities and efforts, a lot of strengthening and streamlining of federal agency approaches toward uh, ocean governance and the, uh, the establishment of a number of regional ocean councils, which under the, commission, the Ocean Commission's recommendations will be voluntary. <clears throat> and all of these are taking place within the framework of the National uh, Ocean Council. But these regional ocean councils, which will be voluntary, as I said, are the uh, institutional structure within which ecosystem-based management is going to take place. And these regional councils are where the very difficult questions of building institutions to actually implement ecosystem management are going to be addressed. They're going to have much broader jurisdictional boundaries than our current approaches to resource management, which is uh, by and large fairly fragmented according to historical patterns of authorities. And they're going to be an integrating uh, effort to bring together the various government levels in various regions. These are different government entities, but it will include state and territorial, in my region, tribal governments, as well as federal government integration. And all of this will be supported by a much more regional approach to the collection of ocean information as well as ecosystem-based assessments rather than single resource-based assessments. In addition to the regional ocean councils, the Commission on Ocean Policy made a number of other recommendations. And these recommendations are interesting because they signal that for the Ocean Commission, there was a very clear recognition that when you look at the problems that we have in ocean resources, the, the base of those problems are institutional problems. 
We are looking at symptomatic problems when we see overuse of fishery resources, for example, or economic losses from ocean resource. But at the base of that are various institutional dysfunctions that the Ocean Commission clearly saw and recognized in its recommendations for fixing those problems. It, in addition to the regional ocean councils, it recommended that we develop new laws and policies and institutions where those are needed, recognizing that our institutional structure and our legal structure isn't where it needs to be at the moment for establishing uh, strong ecosystem-based approaches. We need to work to strengthen our international fishery agreements, the ones that we uh, currently have. We need to consolidate existing ocean and coast, coastal problems programs so that these aren't going along on a parallel track, which is what they tend to do, but in fact bring them together in a more coordinated way. And we need to help um, with interagency approaches to ecosystem-based management because after all, this will be interdisciplinary and uh, interagency as well. And so the Commission has made a number of recommendations for institutional change, it, and I think there is widespread uh, acceptance for this notion of the, the concept of ecosystem-based management, the concept of regional approaches to ecosystem-based management, and now the question is how do we in fact make this happen in an effective way? And I want to talk about some key economic principles that we need to keep in mind when we think about moving now from concept to design and implementation. And there are a number of economic principles that come out of institutional function and resource management institutions as we know them. And there are a number of incentive problems that are very important to take into account. And these incentive problems are things that we observe in existing institutions. They're important because we're talking about human behavior when we're talking about building institutions. And we want to design institutions in a way so that people interact in a way that we get the outcomes that we eventually want. The incentives that we create in the way we design institutions are critically important. And these are, are important not only for the, out, the eventual behavioral outcome, but they're important because they create transactions costs. And transactions costs just meaning the cost of doing business, the cost of gathering information, of coordinating decisions, of implementing decisions, of interacting with each other, of monitoring, of enforcing. All of these costs of doing this in ecosystem-based management are influenced by the kinds of incentives that you create in the way that you design it. In fact, we've got a long history of not really paying too much attention to the transactions cost load of institutions. And if you don't pay attention to that, you can easily build a structure that is so heavy in transactions costs it's so difficult to coordinate and manage and expensive and costly that it can sink under its own weight. And the, so the key design question is how to build these new institutions in a way that the transactions cost load is manageable. And there are a number of uh, concepts here that I, I want to bring to your attention that help us um, understand how these incentive problems play out. We know uh, from observing institutional arrangements for natural resources, we know pretty well what the array of incentive problems are going to be. And now that we have an opportunity to build new institutions, to broaden our institutional scope in resource management into an ecosystem-based approach, we can understand what these are likely to be from the design stage and try to anticipate them and design around these. Now the first one of these is called power ambiguity, and that's just when you don't have a clear definition of the distribution of authority and power, you spend a lot of time arguing this out. That's a costly thing to do. It's not only costly because you don't have that time to do the actions that you want to do, it's also costly because it just creates uh, th those additional transactions costs as people spend time shifting blame uh, to other entities or trying to shift costs from away from themselves to other entities. The second one, the second incentive problem that we typically get is a failure to make credible commitments. <clears throat> and that's just asking the question, can you reliably deliver what you promise? If you can't do that, <clears throat> excuse me, 
because of uncertainty or instability in the system, uh, then if you can't commit to a certain set of rules over time, that becomes a much more costly process. It undermines the integrity of the process. Low intensive incentives are also fairly common in institutional arrangements for natural resources, and that just means that there's a very weak connection uh, between the decisions and the consequences of those decisions. And if you have that kind of weakness in that connection, you are lacking the accountability in the system that you really need to have. Moral hazard. Moral hazard is also quite common. It's, an, it's a rather odd term, I think, for what it's describing. But it simply means that when you have a system that is not uh, particularly transparent, if you have a system that increases in complexity, you are also increasing the opportunities for behavior, unobservable behavior to take place. And we understand that for institutions to function effectively and for costs to be as low as possible, we need transparency in those institutions. Bounded rationality just describes the fact that um, uncertainty exists in natural systems, uncertainty exists in institutional arrangements. We never have full information and we never will have full information. And this will be particularly important as we broaden the scope of resource management into an ecosystem base. There are a lot of areas of scientific uncertainty. And so even with the best of goodwill, even with the best of intent to make rational decisions, it will always be constrained and bounded by the limitations of our scientific knowledge. And finally, truncated learning. Um, one of the things that we think about when we think about uh, institutional uh, arrangements for ecosystem-based management is adaptive management. And people can, can agree in concept on the utility of being able to experiment and learn by doing and adapt what you're doing on the basis of what you learn. But there's a trade-off there <clears throat> in how you design the institutional arrangement. You need flexibility to have adaptive management. You need flexibility to be able to uh, learn from, from what you've done and to change what you do. That flexibility then trades off against transparent and, and firm and consistent rules that you set up to deal with very complex problems. So the trade-off between those is something that needs to be uh, thought about in the design stage. You want to have a very uh, fluid and free-flowing information system. Now here's an example from my region of how these incentives uh, can become problems. And this is the example of Pacific salmon. And Pacific salmon uh, are a very good example of just the complexity of what happens when you broaden the scope of uh, governance. Now this is regional ocean governance. And in the case of Pacific salmon, uh, even just in the harvest management system. It's an extremely complicated system, and in part because of the life uh, history of salmon as a biological organism. They uh, use a lot of different ecosystems during the course of their lives. They're born in fresh water and rear in fresh water for about a year and then migrate out the rivers, spend the rest of their lives in the ocean, and then migrate back into the rivers to spawn and die. So they have a very complex life history. They're using a wide range of ecosystems. And as they do that, they're in engaging a very large number of different authorities. And they are also um, traveling across a number of competing interests. So if you think of them as, uh, in ecological terms, salmon are an integrating force as they move across all these ecosystems. However, if you think about them in economic and, and social terms, they're a very polarizing force because in the course of using all those ecosystems, they are using, they're going into regions of different authority and they are, um, they are dealing with uh, various interests that are competing for their use. This is a, a, a very general schematic <clears throat> of the management authorities that apply to Columbia River uh, Fall Chinook, the harvest management, simply the harvest management of Columbia River Fall Chinook. 
We have fairly clear distribution of authority. There are a number of different entities uh, that make decisions over the management of salmon. We have state and tribal interests in the rivers. We have interstate compacts between Oregon and Washington. Once the uh, fish are in the ocean, they are under the authority of the Pacific Fishery Management Council. We have International Pacific Salmon Commission. Uh, they are also come under the uh, aegis of the North Pacific Fishery Management Council because of their migratory behavior. A number of different management authorities um, that coordinate the harvest um, actions across all these jurisdictions. We also have a very complicated and sophisticated uh, coordination of scientific advice and scientific uh, information generation that has developed over time. And very detailed, uh, I think a good example of ecosystem-based management that has evolved naturally in response to the need to coordinate the, the harvest actions and now in response to um, the legal requirements under the Endangered Species Act for recovery. So these institutional arrangements have evolved over time. So in, in one sense, this is the best kind of institutional situation you can have. They've adapted to change. They've adapted to changing environment. They've had a legal forcing mechanism under the ESA. Uh, they are regional in scope. And yet, with all the time that we've had to develop this kind of approach for Pacific salmon harvest management, uh, there are still problems in having this kind of institutional arrangement be completely effective in achieving its harvest management goals of escapement levels or target mortality rates. There are still um, areas of problems. There are still a number of incentive problems. All the incentive problems that I identified at a conceptual level you will find embedded in the embodied in the Pacific Salmon Harvest Management uh, System. And so what does this tell us? It tells us that even with a long history, even with evolution of an institutional approach, even with uh, efforts to coordinate, we still have incentive problems, we still have difficulties in ecosystem management that we really will need to carefully address as we institute these regional ocean councils. What we need to think about in advance is how we design these councils so that we minimize transactions costs, so that we design around these incentives and minimize the extent to which these incentive problems become uh, effective problems. And to a large part, that's going to depend on the extent to which we can craft a unifying goal for these regional councils that extends across authorities and entities and interests the extent to which we can adapt to uncertainty, uh, to which we understand uh, the economies of scale or scope or the transactions costs involved in coordination, and the extent to which we understand the array of policy instruments that's available for us to use. Now, it's, it's not going to um, be easy. It's going to be complicated, but we do have guidance from experience. We have guidance from theory. We have guidance from practice. Uh, but goodwill in itself is not going to be enough. We need to take a very pragmatic approach to establishing and broadening these institutional structures beyond what they are now into a more effective ecosystem base. We need to especially be sensitive to the fact that regions are different and regional context is going to matter. It matters in terms of the history of a region. It matters in terms of just the cultural, economic, and, and ecological mix that we find in various regions. I support the Commission's recommendation to build off existing structures and to broaden those. Uh, I also urge that we take a very careful look at this whole question of institutional design, the question of transactions costs, and the questions of incentives as we go forward to do this. Thank you. Again, recall we're holding questions till, till the end here. Uh, our last presenter in this session, uh, Kristen Fletcher, uh, is uh, the director of the Marine Affairs uh, Institute at Roger Williams University in New England. She, like uh, 
Uh, Laura spent uh, many years in the Gulf of Mexico with Mississippi, Alabama uh, Sea Grant with the legal program there. Uh, and like our other panelists, is a person who doesn't get mind getting involved in messy things in the real world. Uh, one example of that is she is uh, ascending, I don't know what the term is, ascending to the presidency <laughs> of the Coastal Society, uh, a group near and dear to, uh, to my heart, and uh, the first chapter, student chapter of which we formed here at Duke University, and I know some people in the audience are actually members of that uh, organization. Uh, Kristen is going to address one of the core principles that uh, frankly, is not as well worked out as we would like it, I think, with some of the uh, ecosystems and regions and, co and, and challenges that we face in uh, ocean governance, and that is the issue of public trust and the public trust doctrine. So, Kristen? Thank you, Mike. And I, I want to start by thanking Ingrid and Mark and Sarah, who've done an exceptional job putting this symposium together, very professional, and it's been a pleasure to work with all of you. Um, when Ingrid asked, and she told me the, the title of the symposium, Ocean Ecosystem Management, wow. Um, and we've just heard two excellent presentations about what are some of the mechanisms we can use to get there. Um, so when when Ingrid and I were talking, and, and she said, well, you've, you've written on, on some fisheries topics. Do you want to talk about fisheries? And I thought, well, you know, in thinking about regional ocean governance, uh, maybe this is the opportunity to kind of think about it from a different perspective. And so I'm using this opportunity to present to you um, some ideas that I'm really still thinking about. And so I'm actually using this opportunity also to be a little selfish because um, my perspective working with lawyers and law students is that if you put two lawyers in a room, you're going to get four opinions. And so I'm really hoping to generate some ideas and some opinions um, from you all today about what the true role of the public trust doctrine is and what it could be, um, and, and looking at some examples and, and how it's evolved through history. So from my perspective, I'm asking basically two questions, um, both of which have been touched on by Laura and Susan already this morning. One of which is, if we're talking about regional ocean governance, what are the incentives for states um, to be involved in this? And then second of all, what is their existing responsibility and authority that they already have in order to uh, not only protect their resources at a state level, but also to, to branch out and to reach out more regionally? Um, and when I uh, left Mississippi uh, just two years ago, uh, one of the um, people there said, oh, you're going to New England, you're going to become parochial. And I guess in some ways I am, because when I think about regional ocean governance now, I really am getting down to that very basic level of what is the state's responsibility over these resources? And for Connecticut to work with Maine and to work with Massachusetts and Rhode Island, what is that going to take and how would that work? Um, I really think that the common thread through a lot of this, through most of this, is the public trust doctrine, which is this doctrine, a uh, very historical doctrine all the way from Roman law that tells us that the states hold these very unique resources in trust for the benefit of the public. Um, I, I'm probably speaking to the choir, I know, uh, for most of you, but these common uses that the public had, this access that the public had, was navigation, fishing, and commerce. And one of the things I'm going to share with you today is, is my thought process about how the public trust doctrine has evolved from a use doctrine to more of a resource protection doctrine, and how that might be able to be, to be worked into this idea of regional ocean governance. So. What I want to start with is giving you a couple of examples um, that you might not actually think of when you think about the public trust doctrine, but I think they're very useful examples in looking at what are some of the mechanism that states, mechanisms that states have already used in terms of dealing with resource protection in a multi-jurisdictional way. And the first is uh, interstate compacts. Um, Water is uh, pretty much the basis for uh, the public trust doctrine. I mean, the uniqueness of water as a resource, and it applies not only in our coastal areas, but also inland. And I think some of the interstate compacts, especially out west, give us a really good um, 
baseline for looking at when do states have these incentives to start working with each other, to start reaching out beyond its own political boundaries, its own uh, set legal jurisdiction. And I think these interstate compacts, um, you know, when you're thinking about water being taken out upstream and what's happening to those states downstream, those states are really trying to protect those users downstream. And so they have to start paying attention to what's going on outside of their state. And what are those uses? Well, they're the traditional public trust uses. They're the navigation, commerce, whether it's uh, most likely for irrigation out west, and also fish. Um, and as we've seen in some of our examples in the West now, the Endangered Species Act has started to come into play. So there's a lot of legal mechanisms at play. But I think very fundamentally, the states have reached out beyond their borders in order to provide their citizens with access to these, these resources, to that use. But as you see these interstate compacts being used and as you see their evolution, there's language within those compacts that show we're not just concerned about the use, we're also concerned about the resource itself. And I think that these compacts show us, uh, give us kind of a mechanism to look at how is the public trust doctrine advanced within the states, maybe even without the states putting that uh, term onto it, putting that name onto it. And the second example for an interstate compact is the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. Um, and obviously, fishing, one of our three traditional uses under the public trust doctrine. And the states in the Atlantic, why were they motivated to get together and say, you know, we need to start managing this uh, in a more coordinated way? Well, the trouble with fish is they swim. So they don't know that they're swimming from Massachusetts water up into New Hampshire water, into Maine water. Um, but they do. And the states recognized there really was going to be a benefit to trying to have some type of body that would help them to manage those fish and to manage the different standards that were used state to state, uh, the different gear types, the different seasons, the different allowable catch, et cetera. And so there were some incentives there on a very practical basis for allowing their citizens access to that, to that resource. The other interesting thing about interstate compacts to keep in mind is that they have to be approved by Congress. And so it, it also gives you an interesting interplay between the a state mechanism or a multi-state mechanism where the states have an incentive to be there, come to some type of consensus about what standard they're going to manage their uh, resource by, but also they have this approval by our national Congress. So the other um, area that I've been looking at and that I find extremely interesting, especially in light of um, some of the politics in, in the Northeast right now regarding this, has to do with multi-state litigation. Um, does anybody know where the, the big tobacco litigation started? You've heard the state mentioned a few times this morning. It started in Mississippi, and it actually started in uh, a little chancery court in Mississippi, which is actually a court of equity in Mississippi. And so when you're arguing in Chancery Court in Mississippi, you can go in as, um, as your, your plaintiff and you can go in and say, Judge, Your Honor, we need to do this because the big bad, big, bad tobacco companies, you know, they're, what they're doing is wrong and we need to fix this situation. And I'm, of course, extremely oversimplifying it, but when you took what was going on in Mississippi and started looking at it more nationally, and New Jersey started getting interested, and New York started getting interested, and all of these other states really started to pay attention to what was going on in Mississippi, all of a sudden you had to develop these different legal standards in different jurisdictions. And it was a really, it's a really interesting case study for looking at how do states fight a similar problem within different jurisdictions. Because the same equity argument that was going to work in Mississippi, which did work in Mississippi, by the way, had to then be developed as more of a legal hook in some of the other states. So it's, it is an interesting case study to look at. But I think more grounded in the public trust concepts that we're talking about is the multi-state litigation now, especially in uh, the New England states, northeastern states, excuse me, regarding air pollution. You have this, a lot of people call it this new wave of attorneys general who are starting to take action on issues that traditionally have been federal, um, that traditionally the federal government has taken action on. And so for example, if uh, the state of New York wants to start to fight the problem with air pollution and the deposition 
um, f that's being created by industrial plants in the Midwest, how is it going to do it? If the EPA is not stepping in to do it, how can New York do it? Well, New York is, you know, they're filing a lawsuit. And they went around and they asked other states, are you interested in joining into this lawsuit. We're trying to protect our citizens. It's very much a public health based uh, uh, set of litigation, a uh, set of briefs. But they actually did go to other states and said, who wants to be involved in this? Now, why would they do that? I mean, I, I know a lot of the, uh, the students out in the audience, if you were told to write a brief, you're going to sit down and you're going to write your brief. If you were told you have to write your brief with five of your peers in your class, much more difficult, right? You've got to, you know, you've got to find consensus. Heck, you've got to find a schedule when everyone can even meet, right, just to be there and to, to talk about the issues that you want to present in your brief. So there are some real hurdles involved in trying to, to get the states to come together. Um, but I think there are also some really important lessons within that um, in consensus and part are in um, working together. And part of that is that they know they're going to be stronger. I think the tobacco litigation is a really good example of that. They know they're going to be stronger. And when it comes to the air pollution example, um, there are some states that have not signed on. And um, in, a, in a presentation I saw him do about a year ago, Attorney General Elliot Spitzer from New York said, that's fine. If they don't want to sign on, they're going to be holding us back. So it is interesting to look at what are some of the incentives and what are also some of the challenges that, that the states might not want to um, to grasp. And then the last example I want to throw out is an existing effort. Um, and as, as Susan and Laura both talked about, what are some of the existing structures out there that we can look at as, as lessons? And one of them is the New England Governors um, Conference, uh, which think about conferences like the, the ACC or the SEC. But the New England Governors and the Eastern Canadian Premiers last month issued four resolutions. So they came together in Newfoundland and those are the, the parties up top, um, so all of the states and the provinces that are represented. They adopted four different resolutions, one on security and prosperity, one on energy, which is focused on uh, natural gas, one on the oceans, and one on the environment. The environment was focused on uh, climate change and air deposition. The oceans resolution created an uh, oceans working committee which has been charged to recommend practical means to expand and enhance regional efforts on all ocean-related issues. Very, very broad. And so um, one of the reasons that um, I've gotten involved in this is that the, the chair currently of this New England Governors Conference is Governor Carcieri from Rhode Island. And so this ocean resolution that they put forward, the director of our state DEM, Department of Environmental Management, is actually going to be heading this Oceans Working Committee. So they're now looking to, to uh, scholars, practitioners, managers, and um, uh, the dean earlier said the word uh, scholager which I think is very interesting because some of our managers now are, you know, really becoming scholars in their own right because they have all this practical experience. But they're starting to look to us for um, how do we start to tie these things together. So if you think about the examples that I gave, what are our incentives? Why would the states come together for this? And I think if you reframe that question a little bit and ask what's the responsibility, what's their authority, Legally, how can they come together, and why would they come together? What, what responsibility uh, will they be meeting by joining together as a regional force? And I think a lot of this has to do with the public trust doctrine and their responsibility to their citizens about use of the resource, but also about in order to, to provide your citizens with access to that resource, you have to have a healthy resource. And so when you start to look at um, the public trust doctrine and how it's evolved through some of our states, we can look at some of the case law, constitutional provisions, and statutory provisions that have incorporated the public trust doctrine not only as a use doctrine, but also as a, as a, protection res as a resource protection doctrine. So I want to leave you with uh, a couple of questions. One is, to what extent has the public trust doctrine evolved from a use doctrine to a resource protection doctrine? I think that in, um, you know, California is actually probably a really good example because California in their state, in its state courts, has um, inserted the public trust doctrine into its water allocation system. So basically it has, at, at certain points, overridden its prior appropriation system to say, well, actually, we need to back away from this strict 
prior appropriation, uh, property right or property owner A has the right to this amount, property owner B has the right to this amount, and we need to start talking about what is most important for protection of the resource. The second question is, to what extent has it been codified in each state, both for access and for resource protection? Um, I know in the state of Rhode Island, uh, it has been codified in our Constitution, but it has more to do with access in our Constitution. And yet the um, fairly well-known Palazzolo case, which is a takings case that worked its way up to the Supreme Court uh, last summer, was decided. Um, two summers ago, sorry. Last summer was actually, it worked its way back to the state of Rhode Island. And the interesting thing about the case was that Palazzolo wanted to fill all of these coastal wetlands, which has been illegal in Rhode Island for about 35 years. But Palazzolo wanted to fill these coastal wetlands to put in a high density condo development. And what's great about the decision, well, from the state's perspective, it's great because the state eventually won. But what's also great about the decision is that the judge went into a lot of detail about the public trust role of the government. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't about access to those coastal wetlands, it was about protection of those coastal wetlands. So I would argue that you could find, within these states, you could find that type of resource protection evolution of the doctrine, not only within statutory uh, language, but also within a state's common law. Next question, to what extent has it been applied to multi-jurisdictional issues? And I, I think that the interstate compacts is the easiest thing to look at. And I would love to hear if, if um, any of you in the audience have ideas about how the public trust doctrine might have been expanded multi-jurisdictionally. Um, I think fisheries is a good example, and I think the, the water allocation is a good example. Um, on the other hand, I don't know that we have, I haven't seen any decisions, any court decisions that have specifically said the public trust doctrine should be broader than it is a state doctrine. And so we are limited to looking at it state by state. And I'm wondering how do we start to use this thread and work it into more of a regional perspective? Um, and then finally, how is working on a regional scale meeting a state's public trust doctrine responsibility? Because ultimately, a state is responsible to its own citizens. I think that's a bit intuitive, because I think that um, by protecting the resource, if you've got you know, um, air deposition from the Midwest affecting a resource in the Northeast, and that's affecting uh, your citizens, not only access, but um, the resource itself, then I think it's intuitive that absolutely it's, it's fulfilling a state's role. But that's going to be a question the states are going to have. So I'm going to uh, conclude here. And I have a couple of pictures just because you know we're going to sit in this room today and we're going to talk about these structures and the issues and how would this work. And I, think, I thought maybe we might need to be reminded of why we're actually talking about this. These are some of the resources that um, we're talking about protecting and some of our uses. and. Um, I was asked earlier if that, that little girl up there was my daughter or my child. No, my child is actually to the left of that. The dog would be my child <laughs> uh, running around on the beach. But my two basic themes that I'm going to evolve in this paper um, are that the public trust doctrine is part of both the incentive and the responsibility for states to act in a regional manner. But then also um, that regional approaches, whether it's a regional ocean governance structure or whether it's some existing structures that we start to expand into more ecosystem-based management, that um, all of those are opportunities to apply public trust doctrine at a regional level. Thank you. All right, thank you, Chris, and I've been informed by our organizer that your table mics are on. Uh, I guess that means you better watch what you say to your neighbor as well. But, uh, uh. Questions, comments from the audience? Yes. Um, I'm interested in, Kristen, uh, how the New England governors were able to meet with the Eastern Canadian premiers and create resolutions just from my understanding is that it ha international agreements, and I don't know if it's really an agreement, need to be approved by Congress. I mean, the idea fascinates me because if you're going to take an ecosystem approach, mm -hmm. and New England and Canada share fishing grounds, and it makes a lot of sense. But how was this able to come to be? Sure. I'd be happy to answer did, that. Let me ask, did everybody hear the question? Everybody hear all right? The question is generally, how were the New England governors and the, the Atlantic Canada provinces 
province is actually be able to come together and do this because it's quite complicated with so many of them with different, different interests. But, yeah. And actually, they've been doing this for a number of years. Um, and the, the, governor's, uh, or the governor's conference in and of itself is those five New England state governors. But once a year, they formally meet with the Eastern Canadian premiers. Um, and actually, th there are two other individuals in the audience here, uh, David Keeley and Andy Rosenberg, who might actually know a little bit more of the history than I do. Um, but essentially, there are a number of, ecos I think, ecosystem-based approaches that have been developed between the U.S. and Canada, especially having to do with... Um, New England fisheries uh, and Canadian fisheries. And so I think that those approaches and those examples are there. You notice that I, um, within 15 minutes, didn't try to jump into the international <laughs> side of this. But it is interesting that the resolutions, those four resolutions that came out, those are pretty much the priorities for both the New England governors and the, the Canadian premiers. And I think that shows the trend toward really trying to do this on a, on a more regional level. Yes, Dave? Yeah, the other piece of that is what Christian described. These are just voluntary, non-binding agreements between the states and the provinces. The State Department and External Affairs in Canada were not involved. As Christian suggested, as soon as you start to talk about treaties and compacts, yeah, suddenly then you get Washington and Ottawa really involved. <laughs> so does that mean that if you get a new governor in, he or she can just say, that's fine, I'm not doing it? And that's sure. basically... Yeah, I mean, I think politically that wouldn't be, <laughs> um, you know, politically I think they would stay within the structure that's been formed. But again, it, the resolutions, and if you, um, the resolutions are available online at the New England Governors Conference website. Uh, but if you look at the resolutions, they're not exactly binding themselves to anything. You know, they set up a committee to make recommendations. And, but um, so I think what it shows more is the trend toward trying to work together than the actual structure or, com as, as David mentioned, as the actual um, standards by which they will. So. Kristen, what would you guess would be the first most likely outcome of those agreements? I mean, on the ground outcome, do you have a sense of what might go fastest first? I, I really don't. Um, I know that within Rhode Island, um, I've been asked by a number of people, and I've lived in Rhode Island two years, and so um, I don't completely understand the political structure yet as it's been compared to uh, Louisiana quite often since I've been up there um, in terms of its, its history. But I do think, I've been asked why Governor Cartieri has made oceans a top priority. And um, even though Rhode Island is the ocean state, Cartieri's background is a business background. And he's not necessarily known for advancing uh, environmental protection, resource protection, et cetera. I, I actually think that um, Cartieri has in mind, he, he is now chair. We have an ocean action plan. I, I really do think he's been driven by that, an ocean action plan from the administration saying that this regional approach is very important and that the governors really should be taking the lead. And I think Cartieri has taken that very seriously. And I also think that for the two years that he's the chair, I think what he would like to see come out of this after two years is a structure. Um, and some people may uh, cringe at that thought because you think about some of the other structures that have been created that are possibly working better than others have taken a very long time to evolve. So I think the fear is that if we're just rushing to get a structure put into place within these two years, it might not be answering the problems it's supposed to answer. I'm, I'm interested, having spent a great deal of time in, in Louisiana, Mississippi, in that area, the, the, the politics are different in the sense that in, in Louisiana, Mississippi, they simply say, yeah, we did it, what are you gonna do about it? <laughs> you know, in New England, they're more taciturn about what they do, I think. But. <laughs> Other questions, comments, nice. Yes, in the back, Marty. Susan, I, I appreciate the way you've organized the uh, incentive problems limiting effectiveness, and I, I want to probe a little bit more on the truncated learning issue. When I when I read the, the literature that's coming out about ocean ecosystem management, more and more it strikes me that there are a lot of people saying, oh yeah, we got to do adaptive management, we have to learn from our policy mistakes and, and adjust. And then everybody also seems to like to support precautionary management. And what strikes me is that there's, these ideas are just diametrically opposed to one another. And I'm wondering if, if you can comment on that. And just to, to give you an idea of what I mean, precautionary management seems to suggest we should be careful and safe, and in the case of fisheries, sort of hold fish stocks at safe levels, which will sort of narrow the range of data over which we can learn, whereas 
adaptive management tells us to purposefully experiment with policies where we can learn from successes and failures over a, a wider range of the data. Have you, have you noticed this sort of thing? And well, I, I actually don't think that adaptive <coughs> management and precautionary management are opposed necessarily because you can certainly, as you say, experimentation is the basis of adaptive management. You experiment, you monitor, evaluate, you learn, you adjust based on those experiments. I think the difficulty comes when the idea for adaptive management gets raised a long way down the line at a point where resources are quite stressed and people don't know what to do, they don't like the direction things are going, they don't like the trajectory, and they say, I know, we'll do adaptive management, because it's one of these happy concepts that we really like to embrace. I know what, we'll do that. The problem is then you have lost a lot of your options to be precautionary because you have built up such a, a strong base of vested interest and pressures to not be precautionary and to just push the resources to the maximum amount possible. What I see, and in those situations, those are conflicting. There's absolutely no reason why you couldn't uh, set up a system to explicitly from the beginning to learn from the basis of experimentation that was, and those experiments were done in a precautionary way. Where I do see a conflict with adaptive management it is with the, there's a trade-off between adaptive management and the kinds of systems that we set up that are very particularly uh, careful procedurally, notice and comment and transparent and, and a lot of checks and balances to make sure that the system remains open and participatory. Those can introduce some rigidities or some inertia into the system that can work against the ability to do experimentation. And, and, and that, uh, particularly in fisheries management, where we get to the point of stressed resources, is a trade-off that I, I see a problem with adaptive management. The other part of adaptive management is I think we have some, it's, because it's such a happy concept, I, it, it's open to many different interpretations and, and misuse, uh, and I think uh, it's often not defined very well. It's sort of, well, we'll, we'll do what seems good at the time, and, and maybe we'll fix that if that doesn't work. <laughs> right. Yeah. Would the other panelists like to comment on that? I, no? Okay, anytime you'd want to, just let me know. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments? Yes, Tim. Good. Follow up on, on that just a little bit and ex explore a little more. It was, with adaptive management, that I always think that there is passive adaptive management and there is active adaptive management. And I think what Marty is describing and where he sees the conflict is if you do a more active adaptive management, which is where you really fundamentally create the management scheme to test the principle, uh, sometimes you actually might, you know, you might have uncertainty about what how this is going to affect, so it's the only way you can the only way you can get the data back out of the management scheme, the management experiment, is to not take a precautionary approach, but actually experiment with the resource. Then there's passive active adapt, 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 passive adaptive management, where you create the management scheme and you create a good monitoring program and, and, and you sort of get the data stream and see if you're effect, having the effect you desire, but you're not really designing the, uh, the uh, the management scheme as an experiment, to, you know, sort of to create a control group and a non-control group and, the, and those sorts of experiment principles. And so when you think of, when this panelists think of integrating adaptive management into the, into the system, are you thinking more of active or a passive approach uh, to, 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 the, to the question? Well, I think there's room for both. And one of the things I didn't say that, and I thank you for bringing this up, because this is a really important point the, in terms of your passive adaptive management, as you've called it is that we typically do not do a very good job in monitoring and evaluating what we've put in place. We put programs in place, we have some requirements to do evaluation, uh, but we don't invest a lot of resources in collecting the data that will allow us to monitor performance. The other way that we are, are weak in that area that we pull back is that typically we do not specify objectives for uh, resource management that are specific enough to measure so that you can that you can actually evaluate the extent to which you are achieving those objectives when it comes to specifying objectives 
uh, for resource management, we like to, we, we build these very long lists of kind of soft objectives because we're trying to accommodate a number of different interests. We're, we're recognizing that there are many different dimensions to this problem and it's very difficult politically to narrow down a set of strategic, measurable, targeted objectives. This is our vision for this fishery. This is what we want it to look like. Here's how we're going to measure it. Here are our indicator variables. And we're going to actually invest the resources in collecting the data, monitoring it, evaluating it, and then making decisions based on how, how well we're achieving those objectives and then modifying our approach if, if we're not. And that's, I guess, what you would call passive adaptive management. And I think we, we really don't do that adequately. Yeah, I, I often tell the story of when I was involved with the writing of the original guidelines for fishery management plans back in the 1970s with NOAA. And we put in a whole section about monitoring and evaluation that the councils were going to have to do in the plans. And the councils all uh, uh, lobbied against that. They said, well, that's not our job, and it's yeah. too, you know, we're busy, and that, that, let's, we're just going to do stuff and then go on to the next thing. And they won that argument at that point, which I thought was extremely bizarre in the rational, comprehensive sense. But they won it. And, and you're right. We haven't done it, basically. So, Yes, Josh. I just want to uh, go off and point of adaptive management. One thing that's interesting is that there's a whole school of uh, political science looking at why it is that we ever do anything good in the public interest. Um, going back to the point about getting the public involved. And one thing that you see are these cycles where the public will get extremely excited and Congress will act or agencies will act. And then that's followed by sort of the anti-climax where everyone forgets about it. Right. And so that is a problem in some of this adaptive management. We ought to think about, you know, is that something we want to count on? Um, we might yeah. have a one-shot uh, opportunity to do something and, and create a system that doesn't require tinkering down the road when people have lost interest. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I find it interesting that a lot of the same people who have paper adaptive management also advocate for permanent marine reserves, I think, for that very reason. They're worried about them being tinkered with in the future, right? They want them as experiments, but they don't want them to ever go away. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting point. To me, a lot of this has to do with trust. I mean, the, the, several of the, the panelists said, how does the public involve the citizens? Part of the question is, what do the citizens really think about all of this? And I think you're right. My read of a great part of the, the movement behind the marine protected areas is nobody trusts people to do it the old way anymore. They said, nope, you just can't do it out there. We don't trust you to management in detail. Let me ask the audience, a quick survey. How many of you trust our federal fisheries management system to protect our fisheries? Raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, okay. Two of us relatively uninformed people do. But uh, yeah, okay, so there you go. Okay. Uh, Andy, I think, had your hand up. I'm just by that last comment. <laughs> yeah, no, you They're quick is cut. Yeah. I think both the adaptive management discussion and the public doctrine issues raised by Kristen uh, relate to a, a fundamental issue for ecosystem-based management and for fisheries management it, itself or other environmental issues, and that's how you engender some kind of accountability. I and mean, the problem with the public trust doctrine, doctrine is who is then accountable for that other than politically accountable? So you can get all kinds of structures like the New England governance compact and an ocean policy structure that's created by those governors. Although you mentioned something about political structure in New England, and I found that a little bit confusing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that's the right descriptor. Um, Probably not. <laughs> but, you know, the accountability is to create a plan, but not to actually protect it, the public trust. Um, the, the accountability in fisheries is to create a plan, but not to, not to make sure that it works. Now that's actually changed, of course, with the 96 amendments to, to Magnus and Stevens that put in some direct accountability because it says now, well, you may not overfish and this is what we mean by it, and if you do, something has to happen. Well, what are people bridling against now? It's the fact that, oh my God, you mean we have to do what the law says we're supposed to do? That's not fair. Um, that's much of the discussion you got from the council back in the 70s. Even if you look at that fairly strong legal structure in, in fisheries, and the same thing occurs in the Interstate Compact and the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission to some extent, you then have to look at, so, so how do you hold, hold people accountable even to that strong standard? Well, right now, one of the 
only ways you can hold people accountable is, you know, nasty guys like Steve Brody suing everybody. <laughs> because, because you can't hold the councils accountable, and it's pretty hard to hold the agency accountable because they're not allowed to do something unless the council says so. Now expand that to ecosystem-based management and say, well, you want to be adaptive, but you also want to be accountable. It's not adaptive just to go out there and play around and have experiments. It's adaptive so that you do a better job over time. So we should be careful about thinking about adaptive management as just experimenting so we understand the system better. It's adaptive so that you do a better job over time, but how are you going to put in a structure that actually makes somebody accountable for ensuring that, in fact, it is a better job as you update? So I think that notion of accountability will run through this whole discussion. Susan, how do incentives relate to accountability? Are those related co concepts? Well, sure, and, and we have not, uh, I agree with Andy, we have not um, addressed those in a way that, in fact, introduces the accountability. They work against that, in fact, be, by not paying attention to that. And, and one of the reasons that the council directors, was it the directors or chairs, didn't like this idea of, of specific objectives and monitoring that was precisely that reason, that, that once you define objectives for a fishery management plan quite specifically, you introduce accountability that, isn't th that hasn't been there. The, mm -hmm. the broader you can make them, the more you've got the cards in your hand, you can put down one or another on the table at the last minute, but mm -hmm. you've got a lot more flexibility and wiggle room, and the accountability comes the tighter you form those objectives, the tighter you put the requirements, and the tighter you tie that feedback into, uh, you are accountable not just for process, you're accountable for performance. For outcomes, right. And, yeah. and, and Susan, doesn't the accountability factor directly relate to some of these terms that you went through, yeah. like power, ambiguity, and the failure to create credible commitments, and the low intensive connections? Mm -hmm. It seems to me those are directly implicated yes. in the accountability Definitely. aspects. Yeah, I think Andy raises a really interesting point as well, and that is if we haven't been able to produce proper incentive structures and accountability in single sector areas such as fisheries, what makes us think we're going to be able to do it in an incredibly much more complicated arena of total ecosystem management? It's a real important practical problem. Andy. <laughs> hold for later, but I just want to make sure that people realize, at least in my perspective, we're talking about the problems of engendering accountability in fisheries. From my perspective, wait until you look at the other sectors. I mean, fisheries is incredibly successful and powerful compared to most mm -hmm. of the other sectors, like coastal development, where you don't mm -hmm. even have a structure, you don't have a science structure, you don't have a you have an accountability structure that's even close. Fisheries is, you know, people like to look at fisheries as problematic. Now look at a couple of the other <laughs> Absolutely. That's a great point. Yeah. Steve? I wonder if folks can, can help me out here. You know, this all makes so much sense. You need to have accountability. You need to monitor better and so on. But yet the last, unless I've missed, the last draft bill submitted by the administration in the attempt to reauthorize the Magnus and Stevens Fishery Act, as I read it, actually takes out requirements for example, monitor and have a standard supporting uh, bycatch capability from the statute. So how does that proposal fit in with our consensus that we need better monitoring and more? It, it doesn't. But I don't think we wrote it, did we? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, are we in danger of maybe regressing from the 96 law and going in the wrong direction? I'm just Are you kidding just, just to make sure everybody knows what Steve's talking about, the, the, <laughs> the Magnuson-Stevens Act is up for its periodic reauthorization, and the administration has now come out with their preferred bill to reauthorize in the, in the amendments. How many people have seen that? It's out on the web, actually. Yeah, it's, 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 worth, a, it's worth a good look. So comments on that, that question? Are we going backwards with that particular proposal? Andy? Well, just to repeat the part of my comment before, I think that people are bridling very strongly against accountability. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, this is terrible. We have all this litigation. Well, what's the litigation? It's, it's an accountability mechanism. It, so you, you complain that people are holding you accountable as opposed to saying, well, maybe we ought to do a better job so that we don't get sued. And that, so I think there is very strong bridling against a stronger accountability standard. 
comments on Steve's question? Yes. Yeah, there, there, and there will be because it's uncomfortable. Who, who wants to be forced into that difficult situation? And, but there is also, I think there's also an art to developing accountability that we need to think about. And, and I think often the first approach is in trying to tighten up a system is to be very, to, to, to go down the path of being very specific about process mechanisms. And okay, we're going to force them to do X, Y, and Z. And I, and I really hope that we can uh, just shift the perspective a little bit toward performance outcomes and shift the, the, the target of, of accountability toward performance rather than, for example, over-prescribe uh, the requirements for the use of any given tool in fishery management rather say, what, is, what are the performance outcomes that we want? And then mm -hmm. let's make people accountable for achieving those performance outcomes. So Th there's a what, tension what would be an example them. of where people focus more on the tool and the outcome? You're well, talking about uh, the IFQ prohibition? Well, an example, or? yeah, an example that's uh, recently come to mind is that there's a draft uh, bill to establish standards for individual fishing quotas, the mm -hmm. Fishing Quotas Standards Act that um, includes a number of standards that are um, designed to address concerns related to the use of that particular tool. Mm. But in doing that, it, it also gets very specific about, for example, what is excessive share? Excessive share is always over 1% of quota share being mm. held in any given entity's hands. Now, to me, that's an overprescription because what you really want to do is say, what's the outcome we want? We, the outcome we want is to prevent excessive consolidation. Those have regional flavors, uh, depending on the kind of fishery that you have. The Bering Sea Pollock fishery is not uh, the West Coast groundfish fishery. Those are different fisheries with different ownership structures. Owner on board fishing, uh, the owner must be on board to fish a quota share. Is another example where you might want to say now, Let's back away from telling every region what they have to do in terms of a process and focus more in terms of what is the outcome that we want in the use of these tools. Okay. Yeah, Larry. I wanted to ask a question uh, from Laura about the Ocean Commission initiative. I, I'm thrilled that that's going and that you know, two commission, the commissioners are uh, dedicated to pushing things ahead and so on. Um, it, one of the one of the key issues they address, and seems to me a very sticky one, is uh, reform of uh, governance institutions. Uh, there's a lot of uh, inertia uh, in existing institutions trying to maintain or grow their institutional uh, uh, entity in itself, and so on. Uh, what? How do you see that moving forward? It, because I guess I'm a biologist, and not a governance person, but it seems to me like many of the hanging points are in governance. Right. Um, and so, and so uh, you know, what's the climate in D.C. for a changing structure of governance <laughs> with respect to oceans? <laughs> Ooh, well, um, the, I, I was thinking about the response until you got to the punchline of your question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how, how I can, right. and that's right, that's exactly right. And, um, and, and I'd ask Andy to chime in too. He's shy, and maybe you know that about him, and he, he doesn't like to speak up. But as someone who is a commissioner participating on the initiatives task force and really involved in these discussions, Andy, if I get anything wrong or leave something out, um, chime in. But uh, I'd, I'd answer your question. Just uh, I, I was having this conversation last night with, with Steve Rohde about how the, the work, the, the commissioners who are engaged and working on the initiative acknowledge two things in their own parallel tracks. And one is that um, they're, they're all committed to long-term fundamental institutional change, governance reform that is complicated and it's time-consuming and it's not sexy and it's difficult to communicate to the public. <laughs> but it's also absolutely essential if we're ever gonna be able to execute the, the uh, reforms that are needed. So that's got to be a long-term process that's got continued and growing support. But in the meantime, there have got to be some early successes, some discrete um, improvements that can, you know, for a lot of reasons, including motivational, back to my motivational speaker, can signal to the, to the community and, and, and stakeholders and, and everyone who's paying attention that progress is being made. 
So specifically with regard to governance improvements, I, I, on one of my slides I listed priorities that the task force has identified as, as appropriate for the initiative to engage in right away. Um, uh, the governance reform, again, that's sweeping long term, but an immediate change could be um, uh, an, the passage of an organic act for NOAA, something that would codify the agency and not only just give it a stamp, you know, put it in, in law and say, okay, NOAA hereby uh, technically exists, but that would restructure it in a way that would enable it to actually implement ecosystem-based management approaches. So there are bills in Congress, there's, uh, you know, uh, there's uh, some, there's lukewarm interest, whether it's enough to really make something happen. Um, it's hard to tell, but that's one place where the commissioners, Admiral Watkins and Mr. Panetta, have been, uh, you know, stumping on this a lot, along with other commissioners have been talking to leaders on both sides of Capitol Hill and elsewhere to say, this is really important. NOAA Organic Act, it's pretty wonky stuff, but it's an important first step. And then if we could see that accomplished, then there are many other things that could fall into place. And these regional approaches fit into that network, at least from the U.S. Commission's perspective, in the way that Susan very aptly described as a, a, a national framework of, of coordination and institutional arrangements. Let me ask the other two panelists to comment on their perception of political will for serious reorganization in the ocean's uh, arena of governance. Thoughts on that? Scale of one to ten, ten being high political will, one being low. Just don't read body language. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I think I may have the answer already. I won't make you speak. Yes. Okay, in the back, Dave. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Another perspective on this is, you know, we have to face the fact that we have a Republican administration and a Republican Congress that is very states' rights oriented, and they, as Christian suggested, and Laura, they are really looking to the region. There, I don't think you were going to see a lot of leadership coming out of Washington because they want to, you know, their attack is, well, it's really up to the states to organize. It's really up to the regions to organize. We want to infuse and we want to support them. Well, you know, I don't think we're going to see any significant changes coming out of D.C. in terms of reform, at least for a few years. Yeah, I think actually the good news there is that uh, the uh, – if you were familiar with the two reports, the Pew Commission came out very strongly for establishing regional councils. The, uh, uh, the Ocean Policy, Commission on Ocean Policy, said, well, people should do it if they want to and sort of will help them, and they identified two the, the Gulf of Mexico and Great Lakes. Uh, but what's interesting to me is how much regional interest there seems to be in this, in the Gulf of Maine, in the Gulf, in, in the Gulf of Mexico. The, there's a meeting, is it uh, this spring, with all the, the mayors for, or the governors yeah, from the Gulf of Mexico Gulf to, to try and get this right. together. So uh, the bottom up uh, seems to be actually working in some of these cases. Go out of this side. Yes, I just wanted to, wanted to follow up with Laura. Um, can you speak a little bit to what you would see in, about the successes of what the initiative is trying to accomplish? Is it just legislation or is it something more longer term? Yeah, I definitely think that it's longer term and not just um, specific pieces of legislation. So when I mentioned a minute ago that there are kind of parallel tracks, one is the shorter term, which might be you know discrete pieces of legislation that signal some success, but the longer term is uh, more fundamental reforms that take time, and part of that fundamental reform is a greater awareness. It's kind of back to your comment about the cyclical nature of public opinion and interest in any particular public policy issue or, or in, you know, in the environmental arena, a, an awareness of the importance and, their, um, and the, the, the need to care about uh, environmental issues. So the, the, the effort of the initiative fundamentally and over time is to help catalyze that interest and build a broader base. It's not just these commissioners, this select number of people who happen to be appointed and did excellent work in these two commissions, just grouping together and saying, hey, now we're the joint initiative. They actually really want to use their um, resources as, as experts, as leaders in their communities, as uh, um, possessing a, a certain amount of political capital. Uh, the diversity of their membership and the bipartisan nature of 
Leon Panetta and Admiral Watkins and their colleagues standing up together saying, you know, we all did this work and we care and we want you to care. So it's, that's sort of my proselytizing. I really am a motivational speaker. <laughs> I, I should go into this, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you're not motivated? What? Come on. Um, uh, I think that, you know, I entirely agree with, with what you said on both of those questions. I do think we, we should talk about the political climate issue a little bit more. I mean, you know, the short answer is it sucks. Um, the it's a technical term. Right? <laughs> the technical description is the political climate is pretty bad. I mean, the, the from the um, administration perspective, I think the argument has been fairly consistently a you know a sort of old lawyer joke. You know, my client didn't steal a vase when he had it, it was broken. When he returned it, it was in perfect condition. Um, you know, the the, uh, the previous administration totally messed up on ocean management. Um, we had it, you know, we inherited a broken system, but now everything's working perfectly. Um, so we really don't need to make any changes. And I see, think you see that in the Ocean Action Plan. Um, that means that the, the real impetus for structural change is, is tinkering within the existing structure because I don't think anyone within an administration has a long-term vested interest in making a, a fundamental change unless they're going to do it very, very early on in their tenure and make it their signature. On the other hand, where have some initiatives been, been taken with at least the beginnings of, you know, hints of success? Well, California, possibly Rhode Island, possibly Massachusetts, possibly Florida, New Jersey, and so on. Well, someone might be willing to make it a signature issue for them. In other words, the leadership may well come from the states. Uh, on a lot of these issues, and I don't think that has anything to do with Republican Congress thinking states' rights, because while I do think they voice that, I think the actions are the opposite, uh, you know, on an awful lot of these issues of, as opposed to states' rights. I think it's just that's where the political momentum has a chance um, right now, and I think Adam um, Watkins and, and uh, Mr. Panetta have have tried to take the task force in that direction of working at the state level, not just at the federal level, where you have an administration who sort of says everything, you know, the Jim Conathan line, everything is wonderful. <laughs> um, so, you know, he, I mean, on the conference calls, Laura, you will remember, he said, we're going to deal with ocean issues just like we've dealt with climate change. <clears throat> and I thought, oh, great. This is Jim, <laughs> he's, he's referring to Jim Conathan, who's the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, presence that is the CQ and, and is the designated uh, chair of the, or administrative anyway, of this uh, new council. Uh, Can I weigh in uh, Yeah, sure. actually, because I, um, it's interesting you mentioned climate change at the very end, because that's what I was sitting here thinking about. Um, I guess in, in part, um, I need hope in order to continue to do the work that I do. And so I do <laughs> see a, a groundswell um, more at a state and regional level than I do at a federal level. Um, but I also wonder if, and I guess um, in part going outside of the ocean and coastal community, because you know many of us in the ocean and coastal community knew what a sitting duck New Orleans was. It was just a matter of time. We were waiting for the storm. It hit. You know, It didn't even hit New Orleans the way it could have hit New Orleans, but it hit. Um, and I just wonder if, if now, because of climate change, because climate change is hitting people where they live, it's, it's, um, it's hitting the, the coastal areas in such a, a dramatic way, especially in the last few months with the increase in intensity of hurricanes, et cetera, I think we have people maybe outside of our community starting to pay a little more attention and, and not necessarily, you know, sort of at least questioning the administration's position on climate change, what climate change? Um, and, and so I, I wonder if we can use some of what's happened in the last few months even um, and, and necessarily tying that into things that have been going on 10, 20, 30 years. Um, but I just I wonder if there's some hope involved at that level. And I, um, I'm thrilled to hear that the Gulf of Mexico governors will get together because I think that in rebuilding uh, New Orleans or the, the Mississippi Gulf Coast and the Alabama Gulf Coast, um, that absolutely has to be part of that conversation. And after next week, Pensacola and... and right, and, and, right, as Wilma or, wastes or way Sarasota, through. rather, yeah. 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 Laura? Oh, dear, I'm having complete colliding thoughts right now because I, I, I wanted to 
to respond to something that Andy said, and then when you mentioned the hurricanes, I also had a thought about that. But just to, um, just to one um, point that I'd like to add to the discussion about the impetus within this, the current administration, I agree with the round of points made about that and what's going on, the motivation in Washington versus what may be happening in states and regions, is just also to um, point out that uh, these reports, in particular the U.S. Commission's report, I remember several very um, uh, express uh, uh, points articulated that this is a document that was written to be implemented over time and everything's not going to happen in, within one administration. The Stratton Commission recommendations, that report came out with 129 or 30 recommendations in 1969, and those recommendations were still being implemented up until the creation of the U.S. Commission. So there is a longevity that I think we need to keep in mind, and it's back to my parallel tracks. There's got to be some, some catalyzation and some impetus and some changes made right now to continue our, our efforts toward the desirable state, but it's going to take a while to get there. And it, you've had your hand up for a really long time, so I'll save my other comment. Susan, did you want to comment on that? Well, just that I, I do think the, incentive, the impetus is going to come from the states, and if I think of my state, Oregon, as an example, we don't have hurricanes because our water is way too cold, but we do have um, the, the state is very slowly, I think, becoming more aware that things are happening off the coast of Oregon that are affecting yeah. the economic base of coastal communities. And that if Oregon doesn't manage that change, if it just sits back passively, uh, change is, is going to happen anyway, and the, the water off Oregon is going to be effectively zoned without the state having any Thing much to say about how that zoning happens or how it influences coastal communities. So I think there is a dawning awareness that mm -hmm. we're in a different world now. We're never going to go back to volume production and fisheries that are going to keep our coastal communities uh, with a healthy economic base. Our timber production has entered a new a phase. We're not in that world anymore, and we need to think more carefully about how we're going to sustain <coughs> our coastal communities. And I think that is driving people to that scarcity and that kind of attention that that's getting and thinking about long term, where's the state going, is another incentive for getting people to think regionally and also on a more ecosystem basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and at its core, of course, is broad scale social and cultural and economic change, yeah. not necessarily anything having to do with the fish. So that's, uh, that's important. Yeah. Last question, Tim. Well, okay, all right. Uh, there's somebody who hasn't, uh, Leah. Yeah. I was thinking that there's probably some significant time lags in uh, seeing a management effect and the response to it. So I was wondering, especially with um, some of the stocks that people are feeling crisis about, how do anybody propose to deal with those time lags when looking at adaptive management? Yeah, it's an issue, and it, and it varies across species because they have just different Level, different growth rates and resilience and different population structures. And, and that's where some of the ecological dynamics and the, and the economic and social dynamics can come into collision because there is a time lag. You do need to, uh, you do need to have very good monitoring uh, programs and you also have to have uh, strong enough structures to resist the political pressures, the economic pressures that will rise when you start to get a signal that indicates that maybe, in the case of recovery, maybe recovery is, <clears throat> is happening immediately, that generates uh, pressures to ratchet up the exploitation level again. And, mm -hmm. and so it's, a, it's, it's an area, I think, that you need to have really good integration across the economic, social, and, and biological spheres in order to have a tight system. Absolutely. Well, that's maybe a good concept to uh, close this panel on. I, I think the panel has set out a lot of interesting uh, issues for us to carry through the day, which will be carried through the second panel, which has to do with cases, and then the third panel, which brings us back to the, the concept again. Uh, and I would just point out before closing that with respect to Laura's comment about the need to think 
decadally in how all this is going to progress that it's the students sitting in the room from the law school and the Nicholas School who are going to be actually the professionals who caused that all to happen. So, good, there's work for you, see. <laughs> <laughs> so, please help me uh, thank the panel.